Hey students, good evening. I am recording this in the evening. It's uh, 1 o'clock in the morning and it's nice and peaceful outside. It's kind of cool. I was doing some work outside and I said, let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and record a lecture. It won't be maybe too long. Uh, let's see how long I can go. Okay. The last time we met, uh, of course, we were talking about uh, uh, identity. You know why we're so proud and how we Mexicans uh, cannot be pigeonholed into one area. You know we're not Hispanic. We're not Latino. Uh, we don't come. Uh, we don't. We we do come from Spain, but uh, we're not. From, we're not from there. Okay. Uh, we're not Latin. We do speak a Latin-based language, right? Which is Spanish. Uh, but we're not Roman. It was the Romans that spoke Latin, okay? Or a form of Latin, all right? Uh, so I choose to just call myself a Mexican-American or Mexicano, you know, U.S. citizen of Mexican origin. Now, the deal is, is that in the 1960s, we're going to have uh, Chicanismo come in. And I'm not going to go too much in depth. Those of you that stay with me and take the second part, then we'll learn all about this next semester. Okay, uh, why is there such a pushback? Well, because in a lot of our, my grandfather included, okay, a lot of our uh, grandparents and great grandparents, they felt that if they assimilated, they would get accepted. Well, that's not the case, okay? Uh, racist white America is never going to accept us in any shape, way, or form, okay? So, <clears throat> One of the things that we need to look at, and it's what I'm going to talk about now, is that why has it been that you were not taught this in school? Why is there such a dislike for ethnic studies in the United States? And the reason that there's such a dislike for that, if we teach women's history, gay and lesbian history, you know, Irish history, Scottish history, uh, Mexican American history, Cuban history, then what we're going to do what a lot of people that are against this are going to are think we're going to do is that we're going to dilute the genuineness and I think that's my own verb okay they're going to dilute the genuine well I'm going to say it again the genuineness of U.S. American history you know of the men in powdered wigs and Betsy Ross and Daniel Boone and David Crockett and all these figures that we have been taught that are larger than life when in reality that is wrong it is it is wrong in so many ways and it's wrong because we cannot in good faith say that every single ethnic minority in the world that has emigrated to the United States of America has left a positive impact on this country okay i don't care where you're from you know somalia bosnia mexico spain italy ireland scotland uruguay paraguay you name it you know they they have all left a positive impact on the united states of america and a lot of people think that if we you know celebrate you know greek history you know and have you know a big festival by the way if you ever have a chance to go to a greek festival go they're absolutely wonderful and greek food is oh my gosh it's to die for okay mediterranean food is so good all right anyway oh a sidebar at uta uh in the spring they have like a giant food festival and all of the student unions, you know, the Indian Student Union, the Greek Student Union, the Mexican Student Union, they all cook food and you buy coupons and then you can go and buy this food. It's so good. All right. All right. Just a sidebar there for those of you that are going to go to UTA. Don't miss that event. Uh, now, the other thing is why were early efforts to promote Mexican-American studies lacking? Well, the the forerun, the very first people that do it, do it wrong because they're white. Okay, I'm not saying that all white historians that that present Mexican American history are wrong. I'm just saying 
that the ones that started it weren't very good at it and I'm gonna I'm gonna explain that to you in a little bit and then when we get our first wave of these historians they're kind of like walking on thin ice I mean they're kind of like making this up as they're going along as a matter of fact we still are you know I am just the third generation of Mexican-American historian now let me tell you something if I had gotten my stuff together and graduated when I was supposed to I probably would have been at the cusp of the second generation of historians okay some of the professors that taught me were just a couple of years older than me when I was learning this that's not to take away from them I think that happens because I was born in 1965 and that was the first year of Generation X. 64 was the last year for baby boomers. So I'm right there on the cusp, you know what I mean? And that's why I kind of get caught in this doldrum um, of historiography, all right? Now, the deal that, one of the reasons that we have such a poor representation about is that the first historians that are white use stereotypes they uh, present us as iconoclastic. That means that we're like uh, beholden to icons and uh, just like superstition. Uh, they lack their research, okay? Uh, that's pretty much. They, they, they did a little bit of research and they thought that because they knew Spanish, they knew everything. Um, or they just didn't plow into the material. Like the first Mexican-American historians that come out they plow the material really well and then they plant the seeds so when the generation right before me comes in I mean the fruits of the labor of the first historians is really teeming I mean there's a lot of material out there when they write the first books they leave a lot of open questions and these new historians that are coming in that I'm going to talk about in a little bit they have a voracious appetite and they run with it and then when I come in I am springboarding off of them in other words I'm becoming more sophisticated in my work where you know the generation before me researched Mexican-American professionals or the rise of Mexican-American professionals I may take it a step forward and say well we know a lot about Mexican-Americans in the professional world but what about gay Mexican Americans in the professional world? You know, I'm going to I'm going to work on that instead now. And that's what we begin to do. We begin to become more refined or somebody says, you know, somebody makes a study about, you know, uh, uh, Mexican Americans in the prison system, you know, and they just make a blanket deal. Now, we're going to find out where those Mexican American that are in the prison system, where do they come from? And what was their upbringing? Those are the kind of things that we begin to, to, to research and to look at under a smaller microscope. Of course, you know, <clears throat> when they compare Mexican-Americans at the very beginning, they, they don't do a, a very good job. They present us Mexicans as lazy and romantic. When somebody comes up to you, okay, and tells you, I, you know, I really like Mexicans so much because you're so uh, devoted to your family and you're such hard workers and you're just good people. <laughs> when somebody does that to me, it really pisses me off. I know that we're good people. You don't need to patronize me and tell me that we're good people. That, believe it or not, when people do that to you, they're actually knocking you down a notch. They're actually, they're actually insulting you. You know, it's like when somebody says, uh, when somebody's, you know, like I dress really bad all the time, okay. And when I dress up, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, for a Mexican, you clean up pretty well. You know, like, what are you supposed to do with that? You know, I mean, like, okay, so. Because I'm a brown person, I don't have the capacity to go out and match, you know, 
uh, attire or something like that, and it's it's just really insane. I, or or sometimes they'll invite me to a party. One time I went to a party. I don't remember where it was. It wasn't a very good one anyway. And they say Armando, I made some salsa, and I'm like, cool. Yeah, I look at my wife and I'm like, well, first of all, you know, it really pisses me off that they roll their R's like that. Don't, don't do that to me. Don't practice your Spanish with me, okay? <laughs> I can speak very good or decent English, okay? And the other thing is like, why the hell are you telling me about the salsa, you know? Are other people incapable of telling you that your salsa is good? Because I'm a brown person, I should know everything about salsa? <laughs> That's... <laughs> that's those, those are stereotypes okay you know or something like you know what Armando for the uh, white elephant gift party uh, there are some Virgin de Guadalupe candles in there you know why because you think I'm an iconoclast by the way I am an iconoclast okay I, I mean I am I have my Virgin de Guadalupe pictures you know I like you know uh, there's a picture right over there of St. Michael uh, the Archangel so to a, yeah, we are iconoclastic, okay? But that's not that's not everything. That's not everything we are, okay? Our iconoclasticism is, you know, how we connect with our past. Am I a deeply religious person? No, I'm not. But La Virgen de Guadalupe gives me comfort. And so does St. Peter, okay? And I don't know, you know? My wife just had surgery. And since the surgery started... Since the first day, I lit a candle, and I've had a candle in perpetual vigilance. Did it make a difference? No, but it gave me comfort, and it gave my wife comfort. And my wife is white, but she's caught on to these these customs that we have. That doesn't mean that everybody does it, and that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that we have to be defined by those things, okay? Define me by who I am, not by my culture okay all right you know now in order in order for mexican american historians the the first generation the gatekeepers okay in order for them to win respect in the university level once they got into the universities is that they had to realign themselves and find a middle ground okay and not scream everything not say everything that's been written is wrong okay in other words one time i was told by a professor because i was i had a very militant stage and then i noticed that militancy wasn't getting me anywhere that it was shutting a lot of doors because i was being really loud and one professor was telling me one thing and another professor was telling me another Then another professor who wasn't a teacher of mine, he's a friend of mine at TCC, said, Armando, juega la fría. Acomódate bien, gana el respeto, y después quemas algo. For those of you who don't understand that, he said, I got the job. He says, play it cool. Learn the system become saturated in your teaching become a professional and then you can burn something later on now the question of saying that burning something mean doesn't mean to literally burn something but then you can do something and this class this class mexican american history is a product of my journey in academia i could not have done this i did not have the support I did not have the reputation as a professional professor, and I would not have had the backing to start this class at the very beginning. I taught for 10 years before I gained the respect from my bosses and my peers that they supported me. And even with their support, I still had people when I was presenting this course at TCC telling me, we don't need this kind of history. This is America. We don't need brown history, yellow history, blue history, red history. By the way, those people are no longer with us, okay? They've outlived. They're from another generation. But that's what he meant. And I caught on to it, you know? Yeah, I want to be militant and I want to I make changes. 
but I also don't want to close doors. And that's what was so hard for these new Chicano historians because they were they were inheriting an incredibly fractured history of Mexican Americans. They were going to have to essentially it's like a bad bone that has been set. You have to break it for it to heal itself in the right way, and that's what they had to do. Now, they would they would read the material that they would research about Mexicanos being lynched and about Mexican women being raped and all these horrible things that they were doing to and they couldn't do anything about it because they had to lay low. There's a book right here. Look at this. Look at this book. I want you to look at the, the cover. And this is written by Professor Extraordinaire uh, Arnoldo de Leon. Okay. They called them greasers. Okay. This book, every Mexican American should read this book. And it is Anglo Attitudes Towards Mexicans in Texas, 1821 to 1900. When I read this book, and this is a small book for those of you that are going to go to graduate school, this is a, you can read this in one sitting got great footnotes it is 100 and 100 and uh hold on 106 pages it took me a week to read it okay and the professor told me you need to start reading that book early why because it's going to make you really mad and you're not going to be able to read it in one city there was times that i would only read two or three pages there was times that i'd read a whole chapter and it made me really angry and it desensitized me but I had to come back now what did Professor De Leon do in his new version in the in the preface okay right there what he does is that he adds a second preface and he says when I wrote this book I was really pissed off I don't feel like that anymore I've moved away from that that militant me is now somewhere else. It's not me anymore. And I understand that those things happen. But in order to achieve change, we need to move past those things, okay? That doesn't mean that we're just going to let people walk all over us. That just means that we need to learn how to pick our battles. Is everybody with me still? Good. By the way, students, that book is better known as the greasers book that's what we call it um and if you're gonna take mexican american studies you're probably gonna read it you know if anybody wants a copy of it i have it on pdf you are welcome uh to have one just let me know and i'll email you a copy okay now there are a lot of mexicanos that refuse to see things through my eyes Okay, that still are accommodationists that feel that we should be Americans, and and a lot of us you know, refer to them as vendidos. You know what I mean? They they, you know, somebody, you know, somebody that is a Mexican, but you know he follows another political dogma, or says you know maybe maybe even somebody would call me a vendido because I'm married to, to my wife is white, which is not. You know, as I told you before. My wife is a white woman trapped inside. My wife is a Mexican woman trapped inside a white woman's body, you know. So, you know, and and the whole idea was that the historians that started writing about Mexican Americans, the Anglo Americans, were just bad. I mean, there's nothing more to it. They wrote a history about us that was not true, and it had an impact for almost, I would say, you know, between 40 and 60 years. And that's a long time. You know, that's a long time. It does a lot of damage also, okay? Now, the first person that started writing about Mexicanos was a guy by the name of Kerry McWilliams. And I regret that I did not meet Kerry McWilliams, okay? Um, he is a patron patron saint of Mexican American historical literature. Okay, he was the recipient of the first National Association 
for Chicana and Chicano Studies Award, the NACAS Award, N-A-C-C-A-S, okay? In 1981, it was given, and it was shared between him and Américo Paderes. I did get to meet him. He was already very, very old. I got to meet him for a couple of seconds. Uh, he was very old. He passed away, actually, a couple of months after I saw him. My sister, actually, I think, took a class with him, if I'm not mistaken. And she also went to his funeral services at the University of Texas at Austin. We're going to talk about him later on. Now, what McWilliams does is that he deconstructs the lazy Mexican and stereotypical image that, hey, you know what? What Herbert Eugene Bolton did, Herbert Eugene Bolton is bad. And J.F. Doby is bad bad also and then you have bad extraordinaire his name is Walter Prescott Webb that dude was like toxic bad okay no other historian in the history of the United States or you know what the history of the world has done more damage to the Mexican identity than Walter Prescott Webb what you get from Dobie and what you get from Herbert Eugene Bolton is misinformation, okay? It's like exaggeration and maybe fake news and, you know, just just misinformation, bad research. I, I don't care. I mean, they actually give an award, uh, the Dobie Award, at the University of Texas at Austin where you basically get money to write a book. Uh, it's a very prestigious award. Uh, I wouldn't you know i would take it i would take it and i would do something good with it you know write a book about him and herbert eugene bolton and walter prescott webb and about how bad historians they really were okay uh walter prescott webb was a historian in the 50s and 60s 40s 50s and 60s uh, in the age of segregation his writings omitted uh the accounts of the uh, crimes that were committed by the Texas Rangers against the Mexican American communities. Uh, he portrayed them as angels. He portrayed them as uh, uh, character flaw was that he had an inordinate admiration to the Texas Rangers. He portrayed them as nice, courteous men, not the murderers that they were. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, Webb was a historian probably from like 1918, 1919 till 1973. Uh, he was killed in a car accident uh, on his way to work, uh, but he taught uh, for 50 years. Um, you know, the, yeah, 55 years or so. You can do a lot of damage in that time, okay? Especially when even the presidents like LBJ look up to you. Yeah, I mean, you can create an incredible amount of damage. And he writes a book called The Texas Rangers. It's like a thousand page book. I mean, it's like a, you know, like a big homage to the Texas Rangers. Now, before he passed away, we will say that he admitted that, uh, admitted that there had been some errors in his writing and that he had taken some liberties. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's at the end of his life. Who the hell doesn't have a cynical change of heart at the end of their life? You're you're getting close to dying, so you start, you know, eh, maybe I shouldn't have said that and this and that. I believe that this was a warped apology, you know, I think half-hearted. But the, the damage that he did to Mexicans via the Texas Rangers is still there. And it was there until the 1960s when Mexicans started saying, this is malarkey. This is not the real history of Mexican Americans. Okay? What, what Herbert Eugene Bolton does, what Webb does, what Dolby does, is that they create this quasi, this fake, fake monolithic view of Mexicans. This is a Mexican with his little white unbleached linen suit, barefoot with his huaraches, his big hat, and he's pulling a burro. You know what I mean? I mean, the next time that you see one of your cousins wearing a big hat and acting like a fool, smack him, 
okay? Because that's not who we are. You know that's not who we are, okay? That we lived a very impoverished and lazy existence, that we were conniving, always looking to chingar somebody, you know, always had a knife to come up behind you and, you know, stick it in your kidney. And that, that was actually the train of thought. You know, you don't have to pay him that much because he's a Mexican, you know. He's going to take whatever you give him, you know. He doesn't know English, so he doesn't, he doesn't even know how to count or something like that. And that was well, that stayed well with us until the ni- late 1960s. In the 1970s, it, everything's just like, well, where is it going to go? Where, you know, there's just, just all this going on. In the 1970s was a very, uh, I asked my mom, there was a lot of melees. There was just a lot of uncertainty. The, the economy wasn't good. It was just nasty. Okay, the 1970s, you know, we come out of the Nixon administration. We want an honest president. We elect Jimmy Carter. He is too honest. And then it's not until the Reagan revolution that, you know, surprisingly enough we begin to see a change in mexican-american historiography by the mid-1980s it's well on its way and 10 years later by 1995 i mean we're it's booming by the time by the time i was in school by the time i started school in 96 i mean it was it was there you know there was cima center for mexican-american studies programs Jose Angel Gutierrez was at uh, was at UT Arlington. So by that time, you know, by 2000, we were bumping. You know, uh, right now we're actually in somewhat of a decline. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So some of you that don't know what you want to do, somebody's got to take my place. I mean, I'm 55. I intend to teach until I die. But nothing would make me happier than to mentor my replacement at TCC South Campus. Somebody's going to have to take my place, and I sure as hell hope it's a brown person, you know. So, you know, a lot of you need to, you know, if you want to teach, hey, you know, this is a good field. It's It's not well saturated, okay? Talk to me about it if you're interested in doing that, okay? Are there non-Latinos that help our cause? Uh, a guy by the Leonard by Leonard Pitt. Uh, he's really good guy. He wrote some books. That, they're good. They're real pithy. A lot of information, right? Really hard to read. Very few wasted words. And he focused on California. Okay. Uh, Matt Meyer, uh, also an excellent, excellent author. Civil rights, and he has written textbooks. Meyer and Rivera, Mexican Americans, American Mexicans. I have it right there. Uh, the re- this is the one that I tell you that I don't use because students say uh, it doesn't have any pictures. It's just all. But you know what? It only costs ten dollars. <laughs> okay. Um, Sarah Deutsch, really good. She writes about gender, class, suffrage, and she got a leadership. Okay, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in, in that. We also have James Sandoz. James Sandoz writes about anarchism along the border and revolution. Okay, he was really good. He is really good. You know, he writes a book on Plan de San Diego, did a lot on the rebeldes, you know, los revoltosos, anarchism, communism, socialism, all of that. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit about socialism and communism and how it embeds itself within our Mexican American culture. I think next to next to McCary Williams, uh, I would have to say that no other no other guy has done more than Dr. Webb and I shouldn't have called him guy. Uh, uh, Dr. David Weber. He was at uh, Southern Methodist University SMU. He was a very prolific writer. A short guy like me, bald, really nice guy. I mean, a a Mexican-American in Southwestern history wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for David Weber, David J. Weber. He trained a lot and taught a lot of the historians 
that are now teaching as well. Um, he became a mentor to a lot of minority scholars. I met him a couple of times. He was a wealth of information. Uh, and he preserved the good history of Mexicanos in the Southwest. Uh, and and not the continued non-Mexican American history of previous writers. Unfortunately, he retired to Santa Fe. I believe it was Santa Fe. And uh, he was diagnosed with brain cancer and he passed away. It was a very, very sad day in academia. And they, uh, I think they named the building for him at SMU. Okay, and he was a wonderful man, a wonderful man. Now, what we need to look at, we're at number three, the emergence of Mexican-American and Chicano, Chicano historiography. And is this probably going to be an hour lecture? I think that what we're looking at right now, uh, uh, no, maybe not. Maybe I'll go to 45 minutes and stop it and then create another one, all right? Uh, so they, won't, so they won't be too long. I'll just make two of them, all right? Uh, the emergence of Mexican-American and Chicano historiography. I think that what most of the historians now have agreed that we can interchangeably use Mexican-American and Chicano history. You know, I use it interchangeably. Uh, in the 1960s, that's when you have the Chicano movement, the Brown Power movement, you know, and that's when Mexican-American history explodes into the scene. It's during the 1960s civil rights movement, okay? They also become very localized. The Mexican-American history has never been a homogeneous movement. Never, never. We have never been a homogeneous movement and that is why we can't get ahead, okay? Homogeneous means that we're all together. They put us in the blender, they spin us really fast and you can't separate us, you know? No, no, no separan, all right? Most of the 1960s Chicano historians did not belong to Nacas, they did not belong to Lulac, they did not belong to Maldev, or any Latino, Hispanic, or Mexican-American organization. They created their own organizations, okay? Like La Raza Unida, Mayo, Mexican-American Youth Organization. They created their own militant youth groups, okay? And a lot of these individuals were shunned by Lulac, by their parents, by Nacas, okay? They were like the Pachucos of the 1940s that were looking for their own idea. Why was it eventually successful? Actually, the fact that they were localized made them successful. But when they got to the national level, they were unable, they did not have the sophistication yet to create national movements like we have now. And they did not include women. The exclusion of women in the in the, the Chicano movement, it is, it is my belief, and I have been told by Jose Angel Gutierrez himself, that a fracturing between uh, beliefs, between the leaders not getting along, and the marginalization of, machismo, of, me, of women due to machismo is the reason that the movement was not successful. If, if we want our movement to be successful, we're going to have to be equal to everybody. You can't just say, there cannot be second class citizens within a movement. You can't say, well, we're the Mexican Americans and we support the women, but we don't, we don't support the gay men. Well, you can't do that because they, you're creating a fracture within that movement. The other thing that we do, that they do is that they use a multidisciplinary approach it's not just their agenda. Their agenda is, right? But, okay, the, the master narrative before was stereotypes. And then what's going to work now after the Chicano movement is going to be the multidisciplinary approach. We're going to include in the Chicano history is going to be the master narrative now and we're going to address machismo, we're going to address gay and lesbians, we're going to address uh, women, we're going to embrace Catholics because they're still Mexican and even if some of us are not Catholic, we're going to embrace religion and we're going to embrace social politics. 
So we're not going to exclude anything. And that's why people like Meyer and that's why people like Sandoz and that's why people like Weber were so successful. And that's why the Mexican-Americans that came in after them were so successful because they were so much open, so much more, they had so much more of an open mind, okay? And that's the way I am. You know, I've, I've always thought, you know, why don't I write a book about, you know, a homosexuality within Mexican American culture. There, there isn't one. Not that I know of. There are some. There is a book about homosexuality in the in the western in the southern frontier. And when that book came out, a lot of Mexican American historians shunned it. Said, "Oh, that's a horrible book because it talks about, you know, sex." Well, well it happens, right? Now, these new Mexican American and Chicano historians have a fresher outlook. I do believe that we have a fresher outlook. All right, we're not pissed off, and we sure as hell are not victims any, anymore. Okay, we're not going to follow the narrative of victimization. We're going to follow a narrative of, you know, this is what we need to do. We're not going to beat up on the white man. I mean, I mean, I know that they did a lot of bad things, but we can't just be blaming everything on them forever. You know, we. Once we have the opportunities, you know, I don't, I don't want the white man to give me anything. I don't want white people to give me anything. I just want them to give me the opportunity to obtain those things. I don't want them to tell me, you are not allowed to become this because of the color of your skin. Okay? This is the way it is. Nobody can guarantee what you're going to become. Okay? Nobody. The government, does, it is not the responsibility of the government of the United States to make everybody rich and to make everybody successful. But listen, it is the responsibility of the government in the United States to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to become the best that they can be. And that's the only thing that I ask for. The things that happened before, they happen, we learn from them, but from now on, you're not going to tell me that my son cannot become the president of the United States, a Supreme Court justice, a district judge, whatever it may be, a principal at a high school, whatever, because he's half Mexican and half white. Okay? No. no that, that, that's just not going to work. And that's the only thing we want. And that's the other thing that these historians begin to say. Traditionally, we were not allowed to do those things because of the color of our skin. What does that mean? You know, now the other thing that we do is that nobody likes to be ganged up on. Okay, even if their ancestors were wrong, you know, it kind of gets old. You know, I don't like being told all the time that you know Mexicans are racist and Mexicans are racist, right? I don't like to be reminded about the things that I did in my past that I don't like. You know. We, we kind of move on from those things, right? I hope that I'm not getting any wind noise from the fan. Hold on. I'm sorry. I should have paused that. Um, now, it. I think what we see here is that aren't we a similar dichotomy that I told you before? Are we Spaniards or are we Indians? Did the Spaniards rape and pillage our maternal side? If we get hung up on our past, then it's going to impede us from moving forward. So we're going to move away from that. Okay? All right. What I'm going to do now <clears throat> is that I'm going to stop right here at number four. Uh, so this is a 38 or 40 minute lecture. And then I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shut it down and start another one. But like that, the there'll be like smaller ones that you can watch in smaller pieces okay so again uh i'll appreciate any constructive criticism uh make sure that you give me some likes because and uh, tell your parents if they want to uh, listen to this stuff they're welcome to do so okay you all take care be safe and wear your masks